So today, uh, we will be continuing speaking on heaven on earth. So everyone can see that. Um, um, so as some of you know, and some of you who don't know, who don't show, so I grew up uh, from in a Buddhist family back in Indonesia. And so I received Christ here in Wulunggong, uh, Wulunggong Uni. So I was disciple at the Indonesian Christian Fellowship at uni, that's where I met Lydia. And um, we both grew and um, learned so much in that group. And one of the things that uh, we've been taught is that um, understanding about God's calling, that our life is no longer ours, but understanding there is a God greater calling in our life. So, and then I know throughout my personal uh, prayer and conviction, and also from the prophecy, from some of the words that's been spoken, that that uh, been speaking that I will serve the Lord. So back then, my understanding about serving the Lord ultimately is to become a full-time minister. So that is the ultimate, the ultimate obedience of serving the Lord is to become a full-time minister. And perhaps some of you will say to be the martyr, maybe. So that was my understanding. So it's come at a time when I have to finish my study, come at a time when I'm finishing my, my study and I need to decide what I need to do. And it was a very difficult because I know, um, you know, my understanding that I was called to be the, um, the full-time minister, but I decided to take a job as a software engineer. So I remember vividly that time, I prayed to God. I prayed to God, I kneel down, and I say, forgive me. Because I could not follow your calling. I could not follow, I could not obey on this ultimate calling to be the full, full-time minister, to be a pastor, to be a minister. I won't be able to fulfill it because I'm going to take this job. So then I can get an income, and I become accepted by my parents, and also by, accepted by Lydia's parents. Yes, so, so that's what I do. So I pray, and I feel fitly, I, um, I, I pray to God for that. Thank you. Excuse me a moment. So, and that is the reason why, if you wonder, that um, I will be, uh, I've been avoid going on a boat, on the swim in the ocean, because I do not want any big fish to swallow me and spit me out like Jonah. So, but seriously though, all those, year, all those years I'm working, I carry this guilt. I carry this guilt that I'm running away from God's calling, that I'm not in the best place and I'm not in the right place in the best profession to serve the Lord. Writing code, designing software, doing support call. You know, I thought it was a second grade in the kingdom of God. So now, do you know that doing life, thinking that you are not doing your best or not you know, avoiding things is a very tiring, very tiring life. So, and then I went through that. I went through that. I went through, I was in a very, you know, very tiring but, you know, thank God, but our God is a good Father. So as I'm spending, spending time with God and reading the Word, I discover that I need, to, I need to change my mindset and my understanding about God's calling. So the one that needed to be changed wasn't my profession, wasn't my career, but my mindset on how God can work and how can we serve the Lord. So this is what I want to share with you um, this morning. I don't know, maybe some of you feel like me, feel like Jonah, and then, you know, try to avoid a boat and even avoid going to the cruise. Perhaps today I can help you to, to be set free. So this is the mindset that I'm being challenged 
and, and then I need to break out of this mindset. It's a mindset of a sacred and secular. So sacred is the thing that is of God. It's the thing that is for God. And secular are the things that is, are not of God. As a Christian, without realizing we've been taught and we've been shaped with this thinking, that sacred is higher, is more important than secular. Now, I want to ask a few questions and I want you to answer it honestly. Just answer it in your heart. And I want you to be honest. And then uh, when I say certain words, what is the first thing that comes to mind, whether that's sacred or secular? Church. You can say it or you can say it in your heart. It's really your, it's, I'll read it to you. Church. Pastor. RSL Club. <laughs> Software Engineer. Worship team, hospitality team, productivity team, production team. <laughs> be, let's be honest here, it's okay. SRE teacher. How about math teacher? <laughs> Going to church. Going to RSL club. Emmanuel know the answer. Going to church to find a good girlfriend or boyfriend. <laughs> Going to RSL, RSL club to comfort a friend and pray for them. So by now you probably start to understand what, what the point that I'm trying to make. So sacred and secular boxes don't work. But what actually, what does it mean? Is what, how much you allow God to work on that boxes? Well, better still, there should not be no boxes because God wants to rule in both of them. Yeah. So basically, God allow you to work is not on this only the sacred box, but whether you allow God to work in that. So, I and I just reading the Bible, you know, read the Bible multiple times, and then when I was actually challenged with this thinking, and I start to realize that Abraham is a businessman. King David, the word king itself, is sure that he's a king. He's a prime minister. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. Or now people call it bartender. <laughs> Esther was a queen, was a normal girl, become a queen. And then um, in the New Testament, do you know that in Acts chapter 18, you don't have to open it, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, Aquila, which is the business people, pull up Apollos and kind of say, hey, you know about this about John baptism, but I will tell you about more about, what, about the kingdom of God. So, the, so, then, so then Apollo is humble enough to learn and to be taught by the business people. So this thing start challenging me. So I'm basically saying, I'm like, okay, so God can work in both. Our mindset needs to be changed whether God only can work in the sacred settings, but God can work in the secular settings as well. For obviously ex exclusion for some of them that really, really in sinful nature. So those people, Abraham, King David, Nehemiah, Esther, and so on and so on, they invite God to work in wherever they are. Because as you know, they are sacred place that are not sacred but they are secular places that can be made sacred. So I'm going to speak about the heaven on earth, which is, um, you know, from Matthew 6, verse 10, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Um, this is a short, so I'm going to, let, let's say it together if that's okay with you. So your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So 
It's basically saying there's a kingdom in heaven. There is a will of God in heaven. And let it be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And that's why we call it the heaven on earth. So um, some of the people use the word heard heaven and earth collide. Um, or some people uh, would like to say the heaven is being imposed on the, uh, on the earth. And that is really, really powerful. And I'm going to go through that with you um, today. So now this is actually is a, is a challenging. So on earth... Let's pay attention on on earth. Is this the entire earth or it is part of the earth? Or only part of the earth which is church? But the word of God, see, on earth, so on the entire earth, because we read in all the Bible, in the Bible said the earth are his. Right? Everything's all are his. So that's why... To, the kingdom of God, the will of God has to come on the entire earth. We got a flood on, uh, when was that? Just Thursday. And then the word of God said, the rain is for the just and unjust. But the will of God is basically for both as well. As you can read in the, in the word of God, there are so many things in the Ezra. In Ezra, uh, God used King Cyrus who to restore the temple. Can you imagine that? Using people who do not know him that to proclaim that Yahweh is the Lord of the earth. Yeah. So that's the scope of the kingdom. That's the scope of his will are limited to the church, are limited to the things that are labeled Christians. That's the scope of his will are limited to the Christian things that we do. When the word of God, when in Matthew, uh, Matthew, prior to that, Matthew 5, after the beatitude, um, Jesus says, hey, be the salt of the earth and be the light of the world. Now, we are called to be the salt and the light of the world. Are we supposed to be salt only for the Christians? Only for the light, for the Christian, for the people who are close to us and nice to us? But the calling of the salt is to the people out there. To the people who are not nice to us. And this is, um, this is a, a question that we are all struggling. And we are all in a journey, including myself. Now, I want to ask a few questions. Now, when someone who have not received Christ, and they receive Christ, Yeah? Do you expect the person change for the better? Yes? Common consensus, when someone receives Christ, you expect their life will be better. Their life, their behavior will be better. Now, do you expect when someone receives Christ, their family or the people, their flatmate, their surrounding, their friend, Will God a, will will see the positive impact of changes in their life? Do you expect that? Yeah. No. Yes. Now, I want to ask a, a, a question. Now, so if the number of Christians per capita in a certain area, just talk about in the city in Ilawara or in Ferry Meadow, whatever you want to as a scope is. Say, the number of Christians increase in the particular area, in the particular city or region. I want to ask you a question. Will you expect that the crime rate on that place will go down? A lot of people nodding. Do you expect the the schools will be a better place for the students. And I think Pastor Adrian mentioned this. Do you expect will be more reveal of a justice on that place? So if the answer is yes, then will it be fair to say that we, some of us, most of us agree that we become Christian 
has an impact to our surrounding. So we become Christian, become disciple following of Christ. There will be an impact to the crime rate statistic. We kind of agree with that. So whatever. So because, because then it will not be make sense if the number of Christians. So, so now I'm going to ask a different question now. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I'm going to ask a different question. Now, what do you think then? If in statistic wise, the number of Christians go up in a particular area, but the crime rate go up, what does it tell you? What does it tell you? Devon doesn't like it. Or perhaps the Christian doesn't have enough impact. So let's think about that. And then this is why he's talking about heaven on earth. When we bring in heaven on earth, when Jesus come, then it should be a better place. Isn't it get correct? So because heaven on earth is talking about bringing, bringing, um, uh, bringing control, or not control, bringing peace over the chaos. Bringing the hope into hopelessness bringing a possible from the impossibility. Is that correct? Yeah. So today, I would like to go through, uh, you know, I would like to say, how can then we as a Christian to become a heaven on earther? Heaven on earther. So I'm sorry if I'm, you know, if I'm stretching the language here. So it's a heaven on earther. How can we be that? How can we bring, how can we, each one of us, bring heaven on earth? So there are plenty of examples in the Bible, but I'm going to use Nehemiah in this place. Because what? Because Nehemiah is, 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 a, is a bartender. So if Nehemiah is a bartender, can do that? I think there's more chance that we can do it. I'm not saying that bartender is lower, like, you know, for those who are in the, working as bartender. So how do we bring heaven on earth? Number one, it starts with your pain. It starts with our pain. Now, have you figured out when you come something, there are things, so you, you're walking as a group in the city mall, and then one person say, oh, I'm annoyed with that. Oh, that is annoying me. And then, can you notice that there are different, some people, you know, some people annoy with certain things, some people don't. Some people frustrate with certain things, some people don't. And, and then, um, have, have you experienced that? That basically kind of like, that is annoying. So for example, when I read the Ilawara Mercury the Facebook, where, where, when I see uh, an accident, and I was like, oh, there was an accident. That's annoying. We should pray for that. For some people, they kind of like accident. Yep, just another thing, another day. So not blaming anyone, but but I'm saying, but I noticed that God give that different nudge for each one of us. I can use the word purpose. I can use the word passion. But sometimes the purpose and the passion it start with the pain, <laughs> your annoyance. So now um, Nehemiah. Chapter 1, they said, they said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. So this is especially when Ezra started bringing as well. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gate has been destroyed by, the, by fire. So explaining the facts, explaining what is happening in Jerusalem. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. It was a pain. That news for another person it's just bringing a fact. But that news gives Nehemiah a pain. Why is pain? Because he wept. He wept. So, there's an emotion involved. There was emotion involved. So, it's not just analyzing things. But there's an, you know, people kind of say, oh, what will happen there? Oh, yeah, okay. So, analyzing it. It's good that you analyze it there, that God gives us that. But usually, 
when you bring heaven and earth, it starts with the pain, with the emotion, with the frustration, with everything that's come to you. So frustration sometimes can come from God because God wants you to do something about it. We have a different things that get us. We have a different things. So if you are not sure what is your biggest pain, if you are married or if you are in a relationship, ask those people, what I usually complain about? That is your pain. What you usually complain about? If you complain about everything, then God want to book a greater things in your life. So, for Lydia, uh, for Lydia, I still remember, she's always talking about justice for girls. It just get her. If a girl being treated, not wrong, it just get her. She was like, Ugh, how can that possible? And, you know, what we can, because we are so Christian, we are unholy things coming out, you know. But it could be holy. It get her. So for me, it's about church. When something about church, when I hear about the leadership of the church, and I hear about abuse in the church, it just gets me. I'm annoyed, really annoyed. And I, did, I didn't... Nehemiah is nice, he's crying and wept. No, I was like, one of, ooh, it's catch me. For King David, the Israelites being, the, the, the being mocked by the, the Philistine and by the Goliath, right? But everyone kind of like, oh, well, it is what it is. But King David coming and kind of like, how could you allow that to happen? It catch me, man. It catch me. How can you stay quiet? No one want to fight. Let me do it. So whatever that it catch you, I'm just want to give you a good news this morning. God want you to do something about it. A lot of people kind of say, oh, you, you know, you just complain and say, what do you want to do about it? Nothing. That basically pretty much the same as Israelites hearing Goliath mocking and kind of like, you develop a resistance about it. And the pain is no longer there. Whatever your pains, God want to work in that pain. Our friends, you know, I remember our friend Leticia Shelton, um, you know, in the City Women Tomb Bar, he coined this term, the harvest is on the pain. When we see the pain, we walk into the pain, and the harvest is on the pain. Next one. So after we go pain, pain, what should we do? The lowest thing that we can do or the simplest thing we can do is complain. Yeah. Whinging. You can do that for a few minutes. We allow you to do that, okay? But then after that, I'm going to ask, what you're going to do about it? And the answer is, you pray about it. You pray about it. Nehemiah said, when I heard it, I sat down and wept. In fact... Not only I am in painful, I am uh, I'm mourning, I fasted. He took responsibility, he took action. He fasted and he prayed to the God of heaven. So now I'm going to ask you, when you are annoyed with something, when you have a pain about certain things, about injustice, about all those things, when is the last time you fast and pray about it? If there's something you can do, that is the minimum you can do. You can take the responsibility and I'm going to pray about it. Pray to God for strength. Pray to God for God's solution. Now, usually people don't do anything because they say that the problem is too big. I cannot do anything about it. Now, I always ask the question, if you can't do anything about it, why God keep nudging you on that area? That's my question. Maybe you should pray for God to... God, please make me not being annoyed anymore. And if that is your calling, usually it will not be answered. <laughs> so, usually the problem is too big. Now, if the problem is too, too big, yes, because you cannot make a change, the problem is too big, great. Because the 
bigger the problem is, the more we're relying to God. The bigger the problem is, the more we know that it's not us. The more we need to fast and the more we need to pray. Isn't that amazing? So when the problem is too big, great, that's why you can pray. Now I'm going to ask you, if your prayer life is dull, you got nothing to pray about, perhaps you've been so much of running away from the Goliaths that God wants you to take. Because our prayers, prayers should not be dull. We kind of say, no, oh my goodness. Well, there's a lot of injustice in the world. I'm going to pray about it. And I'm going to do something about it. So when our prayer, we are moving for the prayer from God, please bless me. We kind of say, God, please bless my, my, my area, my city, my place, my, my, the, the surrounded me. Plus, you know, so we do something about it. So our prayer life will no longer, will be dull. We have something to be praying about. When we lift up our hands, when we sing, we kind of praying. Oh God, I'm praying for, for, for the students. I'm praying for this, um, you know, for, from, um, from, the, from the high school student. You know, from my friends. You know, all those things. You, you start bringing that because you know the problem is too big. So ABS statistic to show, um, and show um, that the, um, this is probably a bit of, um, you know, shocking, but the, the, the increase on the assault of, um, you know, uh, which, which is a, have a factor of a sexual assault is increased um, like 20, 30% in the last three years. And a lot of them is actually, portion of them is caused by 15 to 19 years old. That should get you. That should get you. That should get us. All those girls and some of the men are being assaulted. That should get us. It should get us. When the people were being robbed, being being beaten, beaten up, it should get us. It should get us, isn't it? So it should get us. Our prayer life will not be dull because we're praying because we still have works to do. We still have a mission to do. Amen. So, I'm sorry, I'm getting too excited. <laughs> excited or affected, whatever it is. So now how can we bring heaven on earth in our workplace, in our home, in our school, in your vocation, and perhaps in your vacation as well, my as well. So we need to bring heaven on earth in all those things, not only in the context of a Christian thing, but in the context of outside. Um, at, at Cell, we spoke. Um, you, know, uh, you know, Pat here, you know, did um, some works on the... Oh, I already missed the time. I better finish up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Adrian, they said it to keep me going. <laughs> um... I'm sorry, I'm 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 out of time. So, but there are so many that people can do in their in in their works. I'm gonna finish thing up. So, next one. After we pain pain prayer, we need to plexion because I cannot find another word P. So this is something that will get you. Remember, you need to plan an action. Is you need to pain prayer. And then you're going to start taking action. This is where it's actually going to be excited. Um, um, James chapter 2, verse 14 say, What good it is, dear brother and sister, if you say you have faith, but don't show it to your action. Can that find of faith save anyone? How good it is we have faith to God, but we don't do any action. If you read book of Nehemiah, he do a lot of planning, he do a lot of action, and it's not a sprint, I'll just warn, warn you. It is a marathon. Don't expect that it's only going to be two, three months. But whatever it is, it's going to be a marathon. And that's why you need to equip yourself with people that also pray for you, with the people that partner with you. And most of all, uh, you need to have a people that you can be accountable to, to help you to go through that together, together on your calling. Amen. So, bringing heaven on earth... 
bring restoration to your workplace. Now, there is this, um, I, I just want to, basically, what is an earth? What is on earth? So there are people make it easier for us. What is actually the sectors of, uh, of, of, of the, you know, where, where we live at the moment in the modern life? So number one is family. Bring heaven on earth and family. Bring heaven on earth and religion. That should be obvious. Um, bring heaven on earth in media. Bring heaven on earth in entertainment, in the business, in the government, and education. So, so there's some teaching basically asking you to take dominion over that. But that's not what I'm asking you this morning. I'm just asking you this morning, just make a positive impact to that. Making the gospel work in that. Well, how does the gospel work in media? How does the gospel work in the entertainment? How does the gospel work in the business? Think about that. And then now for the people in the business, I sometimes, I, I just want to say it, I disagree with this. Okay? Yes, I'm not trying to be nice, but I'm just, I'm disagreeing. disagree with it. I'm disagree with it. Some people sound like, I do whatever I, I like to do in my business to, to make profit, but then the profit, well, I'll give it to the church. But then you do horrible thing in the business. I disagree with that. Just want to say it completely. I disagree. Because when you bring heaven on earth, you have to do the values of heaven on earth. When you do the work of the kingdom, you have to represent the kingdom. And if you ask, where you can read, read be attitudes. That is the value, the culture, how you bring the heaven on earth. If you're trying to bring heaven on earth and you're being nasty on everyone, no, that's wrong. The be attitude is the value of the kingdom. So today we have learned that we should not have a sacred or secular mindset when it comes to the scopes of how God can work through us. So when you are Thinking about study, to everyone thinking about study for our students and all those things. Think about what God's calling in your life. Yeah. People say passion, purpose. I can say where does annoy you the most? Yeah. So it starts with the pain. It continues and start. It continues with the prayer, and it happens with our plection. <laughs> And you're gonna, that's the only thing you're going to remember today, plexion. <laughs> you forgot everything else. But that's good. You bring order into chaos as you bring heaven on earth. You bring hope to the hopelessness and you bring heaven on earth. I'm going to ask you questions and I want you to not have to answer it. I want you to just write it down so then this can be a discussion with your spouse at your cells. Is there an area of pain you would like to bring heaven into? My first question, is there an area of pain that you would like to bring heaven into? Now, it doesn't matter whether you can do it or not. I just want you to bring it there, uh, just write it down. Because it, sometimes it doesn't matter whether you can do it or not. But if God gives you that nudge and annoyance, it must be God is trying to say something to you. Write it down. And then after that, you speak, you pray, like what Nehemiah, and you speak to your cell, cell leader, speak to another person, hey, I have this. I want to change the words. Um, I just feel like, um, say there was um, you know, a person kind of like, um, why there's always um, spiking on the drink? I'm annoyed with that. Maybe part of your study, you can find a solution. That's bringing heaven into earth. Well, the best is probably not good to the not, not drinking so much. But you know, so you keep thinking about it, keep thinking about it. And then now, after you talk to the person, ask them to pray together with you and what is the next step. It will not be quick. It could be a life's calling. For me, because I've been working in the um, 18 years in the uh, compliance and all those things, what gets me is a people injured, fatality, people died. I feel that those people are being robbed, the family being robbed. And recently, because I'm working in the aid care and the disability, when I, when, I, when I heard the Royal Commission say, I, you know, I, I think 
I'm not going to quote a number, but there's a lot of percentage, could be a 70%. If, I, if, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Pat will probably know, me, know better. That um, all those people who are 65 plus, they feel that they are no longer being useful on her just waiting. That gets me. Because there are some people who want to breed, they can't breed. But it's people who are give, you know, still be able to breed. There should be a purpose of God in their life. It gets me. So that kind of thing, it gets me. It gets me as well, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm apologize for this. It gets me as well when someone say, let's pray for generations. And we're always talking about next generation. And I was like, how about the older generation? It gets me. It doesn't get people. It's okay. It gets me. I'm not, compl- I'm not saying they are wrong. I'm saying this is my responsibility. I'm not whinging that they are doing wrong. No, but it is my responsibility, and I better do something about it. And I'm praying, what should I do about it? Get it? Yeah. So, I want to pray. Before Pastor Adrian messaged me and says, it's too long. <laughs> Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. Lord, this is such a big thing, Lord, this prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. It's such a huge thing, Lord. We are still struggling. We're still grasping. What do you mean by that? And I just want to pray, Lord, that you speak to us. And I pray that you stir our hearts, Lord. You stir our heart, Lord. That we are here not only just to receive you, to be blessed and to see you when we die. But we are here on earth for the purpose to bring your will on earth as it is in heaven. To bring an impact, wherever the, whatever small, whatever big, Lord. We want to say yes, Lord, to the calling. We want to say yes to the stirring of, of the Spirit, Lord, in our heart. Holy Spirit, we ask us, Lord, just that you help us so then we can be able not to uh, be able to bring peace and grace into that um, pain that we not become... Uh, a negative person, a bitter person, but make us, Lord, to become a person that bring good, that do a good deeds, Lord, in all those things, that we can hear your voice correctly and we can see other people that perhaps not as they have the same pain as we do, we can respect them and we can love them and we can work together, Lord. Thank you, Father. Unite us, Lord, and just speak to us this morning, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.